subject of the debate, main challenges put forth uh, to put to the test a contention that Dr. Chang Diaz has been making very publicly, uh, and I, that his technology was critical enabling technology for human mission to Mars that could not happen without it. Uh, the question that was posed more broadly, that is, the question that was posed is, electric is electric propulsion, whether it is or anyone else's, uh, in enabling technology for human Mars exploration. Uh, as you will see when you hear from Dr. Chang Diaz, that um, he is, is, is very adamant that we cannot do uh, a Mars mission without that. And because According to Dr. Chang Diaz, uh, if we try to go to Mars with the trip times that are currently possible, uh, that would be debilitating to the astronauts. But on the other hand, his technology could enable transits from Earth to Mars in 39 days. Uh, and so uh, we can't do the Mars mission until we have his technology. And um, But once we have his technology, then we will be able to get to Mars in 39 days. So, so long as NASA works on his technology, they're working on the key uh, tall pole blocking us from humans to Mars, and we should just wait for that. Now, uh, I think people here may know that I have strongly criticized uh, Dr. Chang Diaz in print, um, most notably in an article that was published in Space News, detailing my criticisms entitled The Mass of Your Hopes. Uh, which was published about three years ago, at which time I challenged Dr. Chang Diaz to debate in Dallas, okay, where we had the Mars Society Convention at that time, okay, uh, so that he could answer those criticisms. He elected not to come. I repeated the challenge for our convention in Pasadena. Uh, you should know Dr. Chang Diaz lives here in Houston. His company is based right here in Houston. He has a large staff here in Houston. Uh, felt Dallas was close enough for him to make a trip to the debate, didn't. Uh, Pasadena is not particularly close to Houston, but everybody in the space uh, community was in Pasadena in August of 2012 for the curiosity. He did not come. And now we are here, just a few miles from his house and his company. And he has elected not to come or send a member of his staff to defend these claims. Now, I do, before I begin, I do want to answer a criticism that some people have made of me with respect to these challenges, saying that I'm being harsh to Dr. Chang Diaz by challenging him in this manner. Uh, I think it is exactly the opposite truth. Uh, I've been involved in the technical community for over three decades, <coughs> prominently for about 25 years. And during that entire time, no person who wanted to criticize or counter my ideas ever once invited me onto a public platform side by side with them where they would make their criticisms and I would be allowed to answer. In every single case, such people always made their criticisms behind my back, whispering campaigns, never once stated their criticisms clearly in print, where I could counter them, or had, at their meeting, where they argued against my positions, invited me up onto the platform, side by side, with them with equal time, not once in my entire career. So, uh, now, I, I, I'm not claiming victimology on that. Unfortunately, it is uh, characteristic of, of this community that many criticisms are made uh, in such covert ways and are not presented in open forum where they can be uh, answered clearly and openly. Um, but nevertheless, I have presented it this way. Um, and he has an opportunity to counter. Okay, now, and I, I told Franklin that if he did not come this time, that he would be represented by an empty chair. Um, could also send a member of his staff to speak for him if he didn't do that. So we have the chair. Now, it is not my intention to mock Dr. Frank Chang Diaz. 
uh, in the manner, for instance, that Clint Eastwood uh, mocked President Obama at the Republican convention a couple of years ago. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, but, you know, he's made his choice. Um, and, and there it is. Um, so you're saying you want me to read your statement about your technology. Okay. All right. Since he was the affirmative side of this debate, uh, and the affirmative team in any debate always goes first to argue the proposition, uh, I will read something that Dr. Chang Diaz said, which states his position. Uh, this is with an interview with um, C's magazine. He says, with a power close to what a nuclear submarine generates, you could use Basimir, that is his particular electric propulsion technology, to fly humans to Mars in 39 days. A chemical rocket makes the trip in eight months. That's eight months of exposing your astronauts to debilitating cosmic radiation and weightlessness. By the time they get to where they're supposed to work, they're going to be in bad shape, almost invalids. They'll have to spend a big chunk of their time just recovering from the trip. That's simply not a smart way to conduct an exploration program. Okay. So if we go to Mars using chemical propulsion, uh, they will arrive as invalids. But the Vasimir could get them there in 39 days. Thus, Dr. Franklin Jenkins. So I'm now going to answer this. And I'm going to answer this in two parts. First, I'm going to answer the part about the electric propulsion itself and make it clear to people why electric propulsion is incapable of enabling quick trips to Mars, whether we're talking Vasimir or fall thrusters or ion thrusters. The only difference is the proponents of fall thrusters and ion thrusters haven't been going around claiming they could get people there in 39 days. Um, but they're just as capable of getting them there as 39 days as Vasimir would be if it worked as well as they did. Um, and uh, however, none of them can be for reasons that are fundamental. So uh, part of this is in a talk is 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 being uh, educational. Um, I'm gonna lay out certain fundamental facts about this. Um, All right, so is electric propulsion an enabling technology for human Mars emissions? Do we know what's the point? It's not right here. No, I don't think so. All right, all right. The first thing you have to understand is certain basic relationships of electric propulsion. It's not anything to do with Okay, all right, all right. You have electric propulsion, basic relationships include thrust equals the mass flow times the exhaust velocity. That's just momentum transfer. That's all that is. Okay. Jet power is mass flow times exhaust velocity squared divided by 2, mv squared over 2 is energy, uh, and dot, whatever. Okay. The, the or in these terms, it is thrust times the exhaust velocity divided by two. And the jet power that you have available by conservation of energy must be equal to or less than um, the, um, the electric power available. So the total jet power equals some efficiency factor times the total electrical power available. Okay. Fall thrusters, ion thrusters have achieved efficiency pack factors on the order of 70 percent, 0.7. Uh, and uh, while I'm not sure that Vasimir has, um, the published data that I've read would not support that, but they may have made progress. I'll grant them that. I'll just stipulate that they get the same efficiency, which is relatively high, about 70 percent. 
So thrust equals twice the efficiency times the power divided by the exhaust velocity. The higher the exhaust velocity, the lower the thrust for a given amount of power. Okay, that's very important. The, um, and because these systems are power limited. Unlike chemical en engines, whose <coughs> energy comes from the propellant itself. See, in a chemical engine, the energy is in the chemical propellant. It comes from the chemical reaction. The faster you flow the propellant, the more power the engine has. In the case of an electrical thruster, the propellant supplies no energy. All the energy comes from the power supply itself. And if we plug some numbers in here, if the exhaust velocity is 50 kilometers a second, which would be a specific number of 5,000 seconds, which is the sort of uh, exhaust velocity one wants and expects from an electrical thruster, and we assume an efficiency of 70%, then thrust equals, well, uh, can you turn the projector a little bit because it's slightly off screen? Um, thrust equals 0 0.028. Uh, just, just move it a tiny bit. It's off the screen. Yeah, there we go. All right. Okay. Okay, 0.28 times the power in kilowatts. So if you had 100 kilowatts, you'd have 2.8 newtons of thrust. Okay? If you had a megawatt, you'd have 28 newtons of thrust. This is the fundamental relationship. Okay? And this is why electric propulsion is a slow boat. Okay? Because if you have 28 newtons per megawatt, 28 newtons is like 7 pounds of push. When you have a megawatt reactor, it's going to be big and heavy. It's going to be many tons. It takes a long time to push that up to speed. Okay. And of course, in addition to pushing the reactor itself, you have to push the paper. So if we do an analysis, okay, now there's a couple of other things you need to know about electric propulsion. When you travel by electric propulsion, the delta Vs, the velocity changes you need to make to go from one place to another, are different than those with impulsive propulsion like uh, chemical propulsion or nuclear thermal propulsion. If you were traveling from Earth to Mars with chemical propulsion, and you're starting out in low Earth orbit, the delta V to go on trans-Mars injection is about 4 kilometers a second. And when you reach Mars, you can aerobrake and for virtually no delta V capture into Mars orbit. If you're going with electric propulsion, you first have to spiral out of Earth orbit, which takes 8 kilometers a second. You then have to spiral from Earth's orbit to Mars' orbit, which takes another 6 kilometers a second. And then you have to spiral in to Mars' orbit, which takes another one kilometer a second. So 15 kilometers a second one-way trip to Mars with electric propulsion compared to four with impulsive propulsion. Okay. The, and similarly on the way back, okay, if the, the way you would go to Mars with an impulsive propulsion system is you would capture into a highly elliptical orbit, very loosely bound around Mars, and that would take a delta V of about 1.5 kilometers a second to go back to Earth, whereas electric propulsion would take another 15 kilometers a second. So the round trip, okay, with actually a low energy trajectory, not a fast trajectory, with electric propulsion is 30 kilometers a second compared to 5.5 with chemical propulsion. So even though it has an ISP 10 times as great, okay, it 5,000 seconds instead of, say, 450 with the chemical propulsion. Okay. The delta V that it needs to do is six times as great. And the, so its advantage that way is not that large, especially if you consider the fact that the electric propulsion system has to move around a very heavy propulsion system in addition to the payload. Okay. So in this analysis, I assumed that if you had a payload of 40 tons, take your pick, it's an arbitrary number, but 40 ton payload and I will allow 40 tons for the propulsion system mass. Okay? 
If I made the propulsion system mass much less, these trip times would be much longer because I'd have much less power. If I made the propulsion system much bigger, 10 times bigger, the mass of this mission would go way up, but the trip time would only be cut in half. It, because, in other words, if the propulsion system becomes huge so that in the limit the payload is irrelevant, okay, then I'm doubling the thrust to weight of this system. That's all I can do. In other words, if I take this pay, if I, if I made the propulsion system mass a thousand times as much as the payload, then we get ignore the payload mass, and we just be pushing that. Okay, but that system would only have uh, double the thrust to weight of this one, where I set these two. Okay, this is a rational uh, allocation of mass because, it, it, in other words, it, it doesn't make sense to design a mission where the vast majority of mass that you're sending to Mars is simply the propulsion system. Okay, uh, and once again. Now, there is an argument for making the propulsion system very long and taking as long as you please to go to Mars. And in fact, that is a potentially useful role for electric propulsion. But if you're trying to go fast, you need a relatively large electric propulsion system. And I have chosen in this analysis here to make it as large as the paper. Okay. Well, okay, let's look at the technology. The, the issue here is the power to mass ratio of the reactor and the thruster. Now, if we're talking about the state of the art, you have the first line. The reactor, the biggest reactor that has ever been built in space, in flown in space, is the Topaz, which was 10 kilowatts, weighed one ton. So it had a, a, a power to mass ratio of 10 watts per kilogram. Okay. Thrusters, about 40 watts per kilogram have been built and flown. Now, if, I, if, I had, if I'm using those kinds of reactors and those kinds of thrusters, and I've got 40 tons to work with, I can actually make a 320 kilowatt system. Keep in mind that that is 30 times as large as any nuclear reactor that has ever been okay, in space. Okay. But nevertheless, based on current technology, if I have 40 tons to play with, I can make 320 kilowatts, and that would get our payload to Mars in 4,577 days. No, excuse me, that's not correct. That would do the round trip 30 kilometers second delta V. That would get us to Mars and back in 4,577 days. So 2,300 days to Mars. Seven years. Okay. Uh, that's with current technology. Now, Current technology is not necessarily the limit of what one could do. If one was look, okay, the 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 uh, the GMO system that NASA hoped to develop to send the probe to Jupiter would have had a, uh, a power to mass ratio of about 20 watts per kilogram, twice as good as a topaz. And other designs that I've seen are quite credible could get it to 25. SP100 would have been 25 watts per kilogram, for example. Okay, so if we take that number and we take uh, the kind of numbers that thruster people talk about that they think they can develop within, you know, five to ten years, uh, all right, instead of 40 <coughs> watts per kilogram for the thruster, 56, um, well then with 40 tons we could get almost 700 kilowatts electric uh, <coughs> on this thing and we could get to Mars and back in 2100 days. Only three years one way to Mars. Keep in mind that Mars Odyssey in 2001 launched in April and arrived in Mars in October. That was a six-month transit, okay? Okay, with chemical propulsion. That's what we can do now. We can do this now in 180 days. We have done it in 180 days. This we do it in 1,000 days, okay? With, you know, the kind of technology that people at NASA say, you know, you give us some money, we can build this, okay? We can be topaz with them. Okay? Now, if you go to people like who design multi-megawatt reactors for things like, you know, the, the vision for space exploration, the space uh, exploration initiative, uh, the advanced concepts people, okay, and you talk about what they can do or think they can do, you know, if they're unleashed, okay. So, far term, optimistic, okay, they can get 50 watts per kilogram, five times topaz, okay, and you end up with a 1.3 megawatt system within your 40 tons, okay? That would get you to Mars and back in 1,100 days, 550 days, one way to Mars, okay? 
okay, just three times what we can do today, okay, or in 2001. And we still have that capability. Um, now, if you really let your hair down and you know, say, well, we're optimistic and we can talk about, you know, weird, you know, technology level one technologies, okay, we can double that. And that would do the round trip in, uh, in terms of burn time in 540 days, which is uh, whatever, uh, 270 days one way, which is the same as a home and transfer. Okay, all right. So, uh, there you go. After 30 years of development, you could get to the home and transfer. Okay. Chang Diaz, to make the claim that he makes in the 39-day transfer, this is what he has to assume. 1,000 watts per kilogram power to mass density. 1,000 watts. And 1,000 watts per a kilogram for the thruster. And then you could make a 20,000 kilowatt nuclear electric system within that 40 tons. And that would give you a burn time of 73 days for, to do 30 kilometer second delta V. But in fact, uh, it's worse than that because um, the delta V each way to do 39 day transfers is significantly more than 15 kilometers a second each way. So the delta Vs are bigger and in fact, and this is why he ends up talking about not 20,000 kilowatt systems, but 200,000 kilowatt systems. 200. But he passes that off as, well, it's just the same as size as a nuclear reactor on a submarine. Just the same as summary. Why not being just the same as an aircraft carrier? I mean, the, the, the um, so this is pure fiction. Okay, and once again, if you look at this, if you compare what is required, okay, 2,000 to 20,000 times as much power as what has actually been built and flown, 10 kilowatts, this is pure nonsense. That's what it is. It's pure nonsense. And I have to say that it is a, a scandal that this kind of thing can be promoted to the level where it is repeated by the NASA administrator and no one in NASA counters this okay, or advises the administrator not to say this or to take this position. Okay, because, well, third of all, because it's false and it's nonsensical and embarrassing, okay, and very elementary calculations that everybody can do knows, shows that this is so. But because of how this is being used, it is being used to advance the claim that by working on Vasimir, NASA is enabling the, you know, 39-day trip one way to Mars, and since we must have a, a, that fast a trip, NASA is working on the tall pole, and so by working on this, we are actually doing humans to Mars today, when in fact we're doing nothing of the sort. This, by the way, if we, uh, if we fix the reactor at this level, okay, because after all, Chang Diaz is just working on the thruster, he's not working on the reactor. If we just use the assumption, this extremely optimistic, 10 times the current state of the art power to mass, okay? If we fix that, and then we allow the electric thruster uh, power density to rise uh, at will from its current level of about 25 all the way up to 1,000, what you see there, if you fix the reactor at, at that level, an extremely aggressive uh, and attractive power to mass ratio of the reactor, okay, the trip time, and once again, this is the, the, the round trip, never gets below 400 days. That's because if the reactor has a certain mass, it doesn't matter at the thrust difficult way zero and you still have the finite thrust to mass ratio and you never are able to do the trip. Okay? And no matter how much, you know, you can have 3,000 megawatts, it doesn't matter, you can have 100,000 megawatts, given that uh, the reactor has finite mass, you never get the 
chip time. And that is also true even if you have zero payload, because you still have to push the reactor. Now, I want to make a point here that was made to me a long time ago, which kind of influenced me strongly, by uh, Kraft Eric, um, who was one of Von Braun's people. And he pointed out that the correct way to use nuclear power for propulsion in space is as an energy source for in situ propulsion. Okay, because you see, what the chemical fuel produced by nuclear power is, it's nuclear power stored in portable form. And so, for instance, if we do this chemical synthesis that we do in Mars Direct, where you're taking one unit of hydrogen from Earth and you're turning it into 18 units of methane oxygen on Mars, with all the energy coming from a 100 kilowatt reactor that you've delivered to Mars, okay, what are you doing? Okay, you're the effect of the specific impulse of a methane oxygen engine is about 370 seconds. But you only had to bring 1 18th of the fuel. So if you multiply 18 times 370, you get an effective specific impulse of 7,000 seconds at high thrust without having to carry the weight of a massive nuclear system. Because, in fact, what we're doing here by producing that as propellant over an extended period, say 10 months, is we're integrating that 100 kilowatts, 100 kilowatts over 10 months, putting in the form of, of, of propellant, and then spending that energy in three minutes while the high thrust rocket is firing. So you're getting the same specific impulse as nuclear electric propulsion, but at high thrust and without having to carry around the huge weight of the reactor and its shielding and its thrusters. Now, I want to shift gears now and point to why we don't need to travel to Mars in 39 days. And in fact, I will point out why we don't want to travel to Mars in 39 days. I believe that the correct trajectory for sending humans to Mars and that is the six-month trajectory. Why six months? Okay. The minimum energy trajectory is eight and a half months. If you pile on extra propulsion, okay, the minimum energy trajectory takes 3.8 kilometers, so that would be delta V out of Leo. If you use 4.2 instead of 3.8, a modest increase, you can get the, the trip time down from eight and a half months to six months. Okay, but what's so special about six months? Why not 5.9 months? Okay, why not 5.8? Why is there something special? The thing that is special about the six-month trajectory is that it is the free return trajectory. That is, if you leave Earth on that trajectory and you decide not to go to Mars, you will loop out to about two astronomical units away from the sun, and then you will come back and you will reach one AU, that is Earth's distance from the sun, exactly two years after you left. So Earth will be there when you get there. If you try to go a little faster, get there in 5.9 months instead of 6, okay, then you will loop out further because you've pushed yourself harder and you'll come back in a little more than two years and Earth won't be there when you are. Okay. So now it is true that if you go substantially faster, you can come back on a three-year free return, okay, and you can faster on a four-year, but how much supplies do you want to take to support the free return? The two-year free return is the fastest free return you can do. Okay. And the other thing is and if you attempt to push the trajectory to going faster than the six month, you require more and more propellant, which means that for a, if you fix the launch mass, okay, once again, you're dealing with finite constraints on the mission. If you fix the launch mass, it means that the payload is smaller. And if the payload is smaller, it means necessarily that you have less redundancy on your life support system, on your consumables, on all the things that make the mission robust. So if you could cut the trip time, and let's say you had a propulsion system like nuclear thermal rockets where you could really cut the trip time from six months to four months at the expense of cutting the payload in half, would that be wise? Okay, from the point of view of crew safety, are you safer traveling to Mars uh, in four months instead of six 
without the freebie turn and with half the mass to support the crew in terms of systems and consumables. I, I do not think that's the case at all. So uh, therefore, the six-month trajectory is right. Now, what else? So you're going to go to Mars in six months, and then you're going to come back in six months. And once again, we have gone to Mars in six months. Okay. The, um, what are the hazards that you encounter? There's three, aside from systems failures. There's solar flares, there's cosmic rays, and there are zero gravity uh, muscle and bone deterioration. Solar flares can be dealt with by having a solar flare storm shelter on the ship. Solar flares were a terror for Apollo because Apollos were three days out, three days back. They did not have much delay supplies on the ship because they didn't need it, and they were severely weight constrained. And that means there was no solar flare storm shelter on an Apollo spacecraft. <coughs> and if a solar flare had happened during an Apollo mission, they would have been fried. But the odds were that it wouldn't happen because you get a major solar flare, statistically, on the order of one per year. And in a one-week trip, the chances are 50 to 1 you're not going to get hit. Okay? And even with six missions going to the moon, the odds are, are your, uh, almost 10 to 1 in your favor. And so they got by. On a Mars mission, the, uh, given that you will be six months out and six months back, the chances are that you will be hit, or pretty good that you'll be hit. But you have enough provisions on the ship to shield in the central area of the ship with uh, uh, food and water and wastes and protect the crew. Now, the other kind of radiation, the cosmic rays, and they don't have millions of volts like solar flare particles, but billions of volts. And they could, yes, they could easily go through five inches of water and, and get you whether you're in a solar flare shelter or not. But the amount of cosmic ray dose that you get is predictable. And if you want to know what it is, it is the cosmic ray rate of dose in Earth, to me, in interplanetary space, is a factor of two larger than it is in low Earth orbit. Now, there's a reason why that is true. The reason why that is true is because the Earth's magnetic field does not block out billion electron volt particles. The Earth blocks out half of them because the Earth blocks out half the sky when you're in low Earth orbit. But the other half, you are open to cosmic rays. Okay? And so they get them. Now, think about this. We're going to run the space station program, say, for another 10 years, with a crew in the space station about the same size as what people propose to send to Mars. Okay? Say six people. Okay, six people times 10 years is 60 person years in lower orbit. If we sent five crews to Mars over that same period, because you can go to Mars every other year, and if every other year you're spending one year in space, so you've got 60 person years in low Earth orbit, you've got 30 person years in interplanetary space over the same period of time if you were flying five missions to Mars. The interplanetary dose is twice that in low Earth orbit. But you've got 30 years against 60. Guess what? The total cosmic ray radiation dose that the International Space Station program will receive over the next decade is equal to that which would be received if NASA was sending a mission to Mars every two years. So, why don't we say we, um, I don't know what you could do about that, have ships that go around the Earth and speak about, I don't know. The, 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 okay, it, this is not an issue for NASA because NASA, um, well, is not interested in using the cosmic rays as a tall pole to stop it from operating in low Earth orbit and therefore looks the other way. Uh, I don't criticize them for looking the other way with respect to that. If they do, they wouldn't be able to operate in lower orbit. But since they are choosing to use the cosmic rays as a snow day, you know, any 10-year-old can tell you that a three-inch snowfall means it's much too dangerous to go to school. Snow day. The ground is white. It is too dangerous. Our regulations preclude children going to school. Okay, um, passed by our school government. Um, okay, there it is. Now, in fact, if you check the record, you will find out that there there are about ten astronauts and cosmonauts who, due to their long stays on the ISS, the Mir, or in some cases, science space stations 
have already received cosmic ray doses equivalent to that they would have gotten from to Mars and back. And there have been no radiological casualties in this group. Nor would we expect there to be, because here's the thing. If you spend it a year in interplanetary space, you're going to get about 60 rems, 0.6 sieverts, um, same thing, uh, of cosmic ray radiation. That represents about a 1% chance of getting fatal cancer at some point later in your life if you are a 35 year old woman and not a smoker. Okay. If you are a 35 year old man and non smoker, it would require 80 gram, 0.8 sieverts to represent that same 1% of risk. Well, if you've got 10 people and they each have gotten a 1% risk, chances are none of them will have succumbed. And in fact, none have. So, this 1% risk, okay, the same risk that we are willfully incurring to operate the space station program, and which represents a modest portion of total mission <coughs> risk. I mean, one must consider. Space shuttle had a 2% chance of killing you if you flew on it. That's not according to the calculators at SAIC and so forth who produce calculations for NASA to justify its decisions. But that is the actual record. Two shuttles blowing up out of 100 and some odd. And, the, 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 and yet I, almost anyone uh, here, and certainly anyone in the astronaut corps, would be willing to uh, fly on the shuttle when they give you an opportunity to do so. Um, now, we consider that a Mars mission is going to be significantly more complex than a shuttle mission, involving not just launch to orbit and return, but launch to orbit, interplanetary ejection, re-entry, landing on Mars, operations on Mars, ascent to Mars, orbit, transfer, injection, transfer, cruise, re-entry, and landing on Earth. Uh, you know, clearly, um, it, it's going to be more risky than a shuttle mission. Say, five times as risky okay, would be attractive. Uh, this 1% represents a modest portion of overall missions and is not a reason to avoid doing Mars, but a rationale. The other thing that zero gravity, well, six months is the standard rotation on the space station, and they do that in zero gravity. Um, so you can do the Mars mission in zero gravity with six month transit. I, however, in fact, do not think that that's the best plan. I think it should be done with artificial gravity because the task of the mission is field exploration, which requires hiking around on unapproved terrain wearing spacesuits, and you want people in shape when they get there. But rotating a spacecraft, okay. Having a tether, I mean, compare this, you know, to this um, in terms of the technical complexity of, of these two systems. Okay, I'll go back again so you can compare. Here is an artificial gravity system, okay, involving a tether between a spacecraft and the transverse injection stage and through it to Mars. And here is a 200,000 kilowatt nuclear. Uh, electric spaceship. Okay. Um, what can we say? So, uh, so in short, um, we don't need to get to Mars quickly. It is not advisable to try to get to Mars quickly. And the Vasemir, nor any other nuclear electric system is capable of enabling us to go to Mars quickly. Okay? And so we don't need to wait until we have Vasemir before we go to Mars. We don't need to do his program before we do our program. Sorry. Um, <laughs> the, 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 we can do our program. The enabling technology for humans to Mars is the courage to try. Thank you. Take questions, and I'm also prepared to answer them on behalf of Dr. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Robert, one very practical consideration here the propulsion unit that uh, required the Ambassador Boyd, you have to lift that up into orbit. Mm -hmm. Now, the first problem there, 
is environmentalists are going to have a field day lawsuits, you know, the whole uh, nine yards. And then if you got past all that, some insurer somewhere has got to, uh, you know, insure in case that launch fails. Just imagine the, the problems. And that, to me, that's a, the greatest difficulty. Well, yeah, and the, okay. That gets to uh, other problems, okay? Because, for example, okay, this mission where I, I confine the reactor and the propulsion system to weighing no more than the payload, okay, this has a total mass in low Earth orbit, initial mass in low Earth orbit of 160 tons, which is comparable to, by the way, to what this mission would have with a 40 ton payload using uh, chemical propulsion and aero. So, as far as mass is concerned, they're about the same. But aside from the payload, which is same in both cases, another 40 tons of this are high technology nuclear reactor, radiator, electrical conversion systems, ion thrusters, stuff that costs vastly more per uh, kilogram than propellant. Okay? Because the, the chemical mission is just basically payload plus tanks and propellant. Whereas this is payload plus a gigantic nuclear reactor, a gigantic high-tech propulsion system, and so forth. And yes, uh, well, there's the issue of, 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 of the possibility of the launch being stopped, stopped by anti-nuclear people, but um, putting that aside, what you will certainly have is uh, an imposition put on you uh, by the government to start your mission in what's called a nuclear safe orbit, okay? which will probably be about 1,000 kilometers high. Okay? In other words, they won't let you start this thing up any place where if it ever comes out, aerodynamic drag would bring it down and it would crash, filled with an immense amount of high radioactive material. Um, I mean, you know, tens or even hundreds of tons of radioactive waste, not tens or hundreds of kilograms as an RGG. Okay. The so this thing has to be assembled, and this is clearly an on-order assembly kind of thing. So this is not a launch in one piece kind of thing. Uh, in Earth orbit, a thousand kilometers up, which adds greatly to the launch cost of the system. So, and then <laughs> when it comes back, it can only come down as far as a thousand kilometers, and any attempt to refit it, refuel it, etc., all has to be done at that altitude. In other words, if you want to use this a second time. Okay, the first time when you approach this, this won't be particularly radioactive. After it's done one mission to Mars and back, this thing's going to be hot as blazes, okay, and it's going to be radiating in all directions other than the shield between it and its payload. And that creates all kinds of problems as well. So there, there are those problems in addition. Okay, uh, Miss. Well, my thought on it is, see, I don't have a problem with people working on their pet technologies. And while I have uh, certain views that certain thrusters might be better than other thrusters, that's not the key issue with Vasmir. And uh, the problem with Vasmir is not the money he's not from NASA for its development, which is a drop in the bucket compared to NASA's overall development budgets. Okay, or that he's gotten a particular opportunity for a flight experiment and somebody else has it. Okay. The problem is, is that NASA is pretending that doing this experiment, they are demonstrating a key enabling technology for humans to Mars. And so, yes, you know, we just had a report out um, by the National Research Council saying, NASA needs a definite objective and it should be humans to Mars. And this allows them to say, yes, we're responsive to that. Look, we're developing a key propulsion system when they're developing nothing of the sort. And this is just uh, uh, an experiment for show. Okay. So it's not the experiment that's the problem. It's not fascinating that's the problem. The problem is the case that is being used behind this. 
Yes, uh, Bob, and I, I, as a plasma physicist, I see your logic here unassailable. However, I was just going to ask, could there not be a role for solar electric, uh, especially if we use a chemical booster to get it out, out of the uh, gravity wells? Well, yeah, okay, look, there, there is a legitimate role for electric propulsion as far as, I mean, possibly. It, it's in the training space, okay, as um, Mars Missions is concerned. And that is if you don't give a hoop about the transit time. If you're willing to take as long as you like, then you can scale the power system way down, okay, and then, so if, if instead of having a power system that weighs equal to the payload, if you go with a power system that weighs one tenth as much as the payload, so the power system's mass is no longer uh, significant, okay, then instead of having a mission here with roughly equal uh, launch mass to a uh, chemical mission, you would have half the launch mass of a chemical system, but you'd have at least 10 times the trip time. So if you were doing cargo missions and you didn't care, you are sending some slow boat that's going to get to Mars 10 years from now, I don't care. You know, it's kind of like the solar sail thing, okay, where you don't care about time, you just care about mass. Then there is something, then it has a capability for that. Okay, it has a certain capability at much lower scale than this in the robotic uh, uh, probes, where once again, you know, they're willing to take seven years to go somewhere, and uh, having extra delta V capability is what matters. So, yes, the electric propulsion has performed well, for instance, on the Dawn mission, which is an asteroid mission, and it, you could conceive of if you had, uh, say, uh, a probe in orbit around uh, Jupiter, say, or Saturn, that was making use of nuclear power to give it uh, high com rate and active sensing. Now you had some power there for those functions, then you also have a significant amount of power, say 100 kilowatts, that you could use an electric propulsion, and that would allow you to putter around the different moons and so forth, and go to orbit around this moon and that moon, and, 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 and you know, ping your robot and, and do all this kind of stuff. That's fine. I'm not saying that electric propulsion is a useless technology. Okay? What I am saying is that this particular piece of hype is completely false. It's completely and utterly false. This technology is not a technology for quick trips to Mars. And the, well, I've already said it isn't. Are the numbers on this chart back into the number that you say that Shang has to have. Are, are the numbers on this chart the numbers that he claims for himself? Yes. Um, well, no. He he claims the um, the thousand watts per kilogram, which is one kilogram per kilowatt. He, he, he said he, yes. He says yeah. I gotta have that. Um, the but he passes it off with a wave of the hand. That yes, if we just had a reactor that had the same power as a submarine. Uh, or in another case, uh, the ship for a 39-day mission to Mars is that much, is not that much different from a 747 jumbo jet in terms of power. And to someone who is not acquainted with what those sentences actually mean, he appears to be saying, okay, and he said that he can send people to Mars in 39 days, okay, and the he is advertising this system to get people to Mars in 39 days. And it's like, uh, look, you can get to Mars in 200 days right now. If I'm allowed to slip two decimal places, that gets us to Mars in two days right there. I mean, think, 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 think. Okay, that's because that's what he's doing. You know, he's going from uh, 100 kilograms per kilowatt, which is the reality, to one kilogram per kilowatt, and it's it's so, just nonsense. So when he says that. Could do it if he had a reactor with the same efficiency as a, a submarine reactor. Well, is, is that number what a submarine reactor can do? Well, no, a submarine reactor doesn't have that power of mass ratio either, even though it can dispose of heat to the ocean yeah. instead of having gigantic radiators. Uh, uh, it was pointed out to me earlier that these radiators actually have larger area than solar panels of the same power rating. Um, the, okay. But the... the uh, uh, okay. The, the other okay. point 
that I'm trying to get to here in my question is, are your claims for what the is saying the same as his claims for what he's saying? He is saying he can get to Mars in 39 days. Yeah. He occasionally mentions that this requires one kilogram per kilowatt. Okay? Uh, but the audiences that are listening to him don't understand that one kilogram per kilowatt is like steel with the weight of wall Okay, That's what it, the problem here is. And then furthermore, he is very clearly saying that we cannot accept flights to Mars in six months, that it must be done in something on the order of 39 days, and that he has the answer for it. Okay, That's the thing. Now, once again, it, it wouldn't matter if Vasimir was 100% efficient. It wouldn't matter if Vasimir weighed nothing. Given the reality of what space power systems weigh, or are likely to weigh with massive improvements, okay, the claim that this system can get you to Mars in 39 days is false. That's over. Uh, what, how about this gentleman here in the big background? Yes, that's right. All right. I don't expect you to have numbers off the top of your head, but looking at this, I'm very curious as an additional point of comparison. If you did have this magical 1,000 watts per kilogram nuclear space reactor, and instead of hooking it up to an electric propulsion system, if you used it in a nuclear thermal system, what would you get? Well, a nuclear thermal system is a much simpler system than this. Uh, and it is much lighter uh, because a nuclear thermal system doesn't need to convert anything to electricity. It is just a reactor and you run hot hydrogen through cooling channels so you have convective heat transfer which goes immediately into the propellant which, and that's what cools the engine uh, and it exhausts directly out. Which is why, uh, you know, a chemical rocket engine has typically it might have a thrust to weight of 40. A nuclear thermal rocket, because it does involve a somewhat heavy reactor, but otherwise it's much simpler than, than this kind of thing, would have a, a thrust to weight of perhaps four. Okay? A, uh, a, a nuclear electric propulsion system has a thrust to weight ratio of like 10 to the minus four. Okay? Um, and so it's completely different animals. So, uh, reactors um, in the NERVA program were tested that had powers of 1,500 megawatts, okay? um, and they weighed, you know, I don't know, 20 tons or something. Okay, the uh, nuclear electric is a totally different animal, and. Um, and we, we've never built one. No one's ever built one more than uh, 10 kilowatts. Other? Uh, yeah. Um, I am interested in comparing the chemical to the, to the electric, thermal, and so forth. And I, I agree with you 100% that there's absolutely no delay in waiting. And it's actually a lot of the people in Washington who use all these different excuses to say it's a delay. But, uh, we have a pretty good idea how much thrust you need for regular chemical rockets. But say you have a 100 ton, is a nice round number, vehicle you want to transit to Mars with a, with a delta V uh, leaving Earth escape velocity and arriving at Mars, uh, you know, uh, how, what, if, how much uh, thrust would you want to have on that electric <coughs> rocket, and presuming with thrust for like several months at a time? Well, you can do the calculation here. If you, I mean, you can get an approximate calculation here. It's a little bit more detailed. Yeah. But if you realize that it's 0 0.028 newtons per kilowatt, or 28 newtons per ton, okay, then if you had a 100 ton, uh, excuse me, 128 newtons, not per ton, but per megawatt, right. Okay, and if you had a, a system that had a mass to power ratio of 20 kilograms per kilowatt, that's 20 tons per megawatt. So now you've got, you 
You've got one megawatt, you've got 28 newtons, you're pushing 20 tons. You can calculate how long it will take to accelerate 20 tons with 28 newtons. It takes a long time. 28 newtons is about 2.8 kilograms of force, right? It, yeah, it, 28 newtons is like six and a half pounds of yeah, force, right? right. So it's not very much. No, it takes a long time to push it. And of course, now some of the probes, the unmanned probes, have actually proved the validity of it for very long distance missions that take years to gradually gain speed because they're running an engine continuously over 30 years. That's right. An un, for unmanned probes, electric propulsion is potentially interesting because time is not an issue. But if the issue here is trying to achieve quick trips to Mars, this is simply not the answer. Way in the back. Okay. Um, Bob, you mentioned that uh, we basically have a basic motivation to go there faster to reduce radiation We have a very highly radioactive reactor, and we're going to be very weightless. So I'm wondering whether the shielding for the crew has been taken into account, and whether that offsets some of the savings. <coughs> Uh, sometimes, uh, it's, you know, um, the, but there is that, there is the issue of, of the trap radiation belts and what that does not only to the crew but to electronics and all kinds of things. Uh, you know, you can get into alternative things here where you um, transfer the crew to the ship uh, when it, after it has almost uh, escaped the Earth. But now you're introducing space taxis and other things into your architecture and all this kind of stuff. Um, I'm out of time. Um, <laughs> okay, but yeah, that, that's an issue as well. But the point here is that, um, like I said, uh, we don't need to go to Mars faster than the six months that we can do it now. And the Vasimir wouldn't enable us to do it in any case, and so holding off on humans to Mars until we have things like Vasimir makes no sense and has no justification. That concludes the debate. <laughs>